Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the IoT ML Lab series. Uh, this is going to be part three, where we're going to continue along in our journey of Vue. And now that we know the basics of interacting with Vue, of storing data, passing it between components, we're going to dive a little bit deeper and we're going to start building in the functionality of our actual sensor. So in part two, uh, the last part, we just uh, discussed how to move that data, how to store it, how to just in general turn pieces of logic into view components. And now we're gonna build on that and go into part three with adding in the first step of our sensor, which is the webcam capture and just a basic UI for interacting with our app. So at this point, if you've been following along, you probably know um, where to get to the IoT project, IoT lab. And this is gonna be part three. So link will be in the video as always. Um, if we get a, just a little high level overview in terms of what we're going to get into. So uh, we're gonna add in a video reference in our HTML. So we're gonna add, we need that for the capture component because in order for TensorFlow.js to work in the browser, it needs to attach itself to a video or a collection of images. So we're also gonna add a canvas element in our HTML. Um, and that's gonna be just for the purpose of capturing images if we, if we wanna go the image route rather than the video route. And then we're gonna implement the get user media uh, function from the web API, which is really gonna be the navigator object to capture user video. And number four, we're gonna also add that capture method that I talked about because again, I think we'd, we'd wanna focus on a uh, video stream for the purposes of this video, but if you're working in a browser which is less than powerful, or if you just wanna make sure that accessibility is the highest it can be, you probably wanna know how to make this work with just static images, or at least how to capture them in the first place and do something else with them later. And of course, number five, the last one is, we're gonna just implement some basic, basic feedback to know whether or not a video and an image capture are working. Um, again, if you think of this in an app context, whether you're a user, whether you're the developer, you need some kind of information to know uh, if, if your things are working correctly. And especially in this context, um, pretty much, well, the privacy issue is, is always a global one. But in this context, of course, you can imagine we're, we're dealing with a webcam, um, whether it's on a, a laptop device, desktop device, or this could be mobile just because it's a web app again. Um, so there's a lot of security and permissions issues that we have to deal with. And because of that, sometimes that can mean that it's it's hard to debug, you know, um, especially if you're like me and you've got some um, ad blocker and anti-tracking uh, plugins on your Chrome, um, like many other people do. So it's just something to be aware of. And that's why a, a basic kind of feedback system and, and understanding what's working is going to be pretty, pretty critical in this context. So um, again, in terms of additional resources, I linked, uh, this is a good one. And um, I linked to uh, the raw documentation of the get user media um, function in the media devices API. So um, in general, the Mozilla developer docs are an incredibly useful um, piece of information when you're doing web projects. Um, and this really, I mean, you can, you can see how long this is, but it really goes into the specifics and details of um, the video capture API, which is very, very extensive. And it's worth being familiar with um, if this is a type of application that you're going to be digging into more in depth in the future. So I definitely want to highlight that resource. Um, and then this is another link to a uh, more hands-on tutorial about how to do exactly what we're going to do um, just in a little bit of a different way. All right. So code highlights, again, I'm not going to go into that. We're just going to go straight into the uh, app structure here. So um, this looks familiar. Uh, App.view is pretty much the same, but there's a little bit of things happening here. So we have turned in uh, the component from last part into something more specific. So it's not just a generic placeholder component. This time we've created a placeholder for the webcam photos um, because we know that that's, that's, that's a thing that we're going to need. So in the app.view, we're really all we're doing still is just mounting that component component and we are using it here in our template. So we're passing it some properties. As you can see, you remember what properties are. Um, it's just a simple width and a height this time. So you can imagine what they're, that's gonna do to us and we're gonna actually see what it's gonna do and get into this guy. So this is where we're going to handle our video capture and our image capture. So before I get into the code, I wanna um, just break out for a second and actually show what this is going to do and supposed to do. 
Um, so you can see that it's going to pop up. Um, well, actually, for you guys, since this is the first time popping up, it's probably going to uh, have a little drop down with your permission, uh, asking for your permission. So um, allow access to your webcam, of course, if you feel comfortable with it. Um, and if you do allow access, then this is what should pop up. So the little title, a video capture page, which should um, access your device's webcam, and this message down here, which has video, video capture initialized along with this capture button. So you can see right now, this is a live video. I can move and this is updating. Um, and if we hit capture, this is going to save a static image for us. So now I'm moving, obviously the image isn't moving. And if I was to take a photo, it's just gonna update the photo. And that's just that. Okay, so as far as the web capture API, though, that will that'll get us where we need to be because now we're going to have a video stream and we're going to have a way to um, access those images that we capture. So what does this component look like? Um, there's a lot of things going on. This is a bit of a jump from uh, the previous kind of step by step evolution that we've done, but I'm going to go through it and I think it'll make sense by the time we're done. And again, with glitch. Um, feel free to remix this. This is going to be, I think, an interesting playground um, for you guys if, if you haven't used this kind of API before. There's a ton of things that are possible with the um, video element. So check out the documentation and, and start playing around. So the first thing I want to get into is the props. We looked at that in app.view, and it's kind of exactly what you'd expect. We're passing in a width and a height. Um, yes, theoretically, this should probably be a number, but I was lazy and I did a string. So there, that's just what it is. But you can see it, it works exactly the same way. Um, and one syntax that we, we may not have seen yet is this guy right here. So um, the semicolon in front of the tag means that we're not just going to pass it. If we were to do, um, uh, my cursor escaped for me. If we were just going to do this, um, basically what this is going to tell view is that we're passing in a little string, but we're not passing in a little string. When we do this, we're telling view that we're doing a dyna dynamic two-way data binding. And the semicolon is going to tell it that width is something that it should find in the view component. And in our case, it's a prop that's being passed down uh, from above. And you can see how we did it in app.view. Width was, a, okay, string, probably shouldn't be a string again. Um, but for the purposes of this, it's going to work. So we pass a string called 640, and here we dynamically bind that information. So this is going to um, dynamically interpret this at runtime. So it doesn't really matter that I did a string, and actually it's kind of better for, for this learning purposes here, but um, it'll dynamically evaluate it at runtime. And if it's supposed to be a number, it's going to try and force that thing to be a number. And in our case, it is. Um, it, it'll work just fine. So. Um, this syntax is what that means, and we'll, we're going to use this throughout. Um, you're going to you're going to see some more examples down here as well. But that's what we're doing with the width and the height. We're just passing in the props. So while we're on those props, let's look at the actual um, elements that they affect. Uh, we've created a video, right? That's that video capture that we looked at. Actually, I'm just going to keep this open. Um, that's just this guy right here. That's what an HTML video is. Um, a uh, ref, I've given it a, oops, sorry, up here, I've given it a ref called video. So this is a view specific uh, thing that is worth knowing. So this is essentially giving us an explicit reference to this element. Um, so if for any reason I need to do any manipulation or access this raw video element, I can do that by this ref. And we're going to see an example of that um, actually right here. So if this is something that we want to do, which in our case it is, and we'll talk about this method in a second, but um, this dot dollar sign refs is the view syntax, and then you do dot notation and the name of your ref. So this is going to give us explicit access to that um, HTML element. So let me show you, I believe this is actually part of our component, so I should be able to quickly show that. Uh, okay, so this is obviously all we're going to see in view DevTools because this is, you know, a layered object um, that we're not going to expand. but um, video, in my case, I've just so happened to save it to the data object, and this is what it is. It's just the raw HTML element. If I click this, this is exactly what it is. This guy that I'm now, I don't know where I'm dragging it into, but this guy is, is what it's saving. Uh, didn't mean to actually edit the site. There we go. Okay. Uh, so that's our video element. And then we have a canvas. Um, so why do we, what is a canvas? Why do we have it? Uh, canvas is a multifunctional part of HTML. And 
the the depths to which Canvas is useful are are incredibly many. I don't want to go into um, that because it's a massive rabbit hole, and I frankly I'm not the expert on Canvas. But um, multifunctional thing, if you want to render images and capture images, uh, definitely look into that outside of this workshop. But in our case, our Canvas is going to be used as a way to capture the image, and we just kind of need it to be there so that it can hold some image data for us to take out of it. Now, you can see that it's really similar in the way that I've defined it to the video. There is a width, a height. They're actually exactly the same as the video. Um, the only difference is I've set a different ID and a reference. So why have I done that? Um, I'm going to minimize this for a quick second, and I'm going to go. And before I explain that, um, you might also wonder where the canvas is. Well, it's nowhere. Um, this CSS is telling us that this canvas won't actually be rendered in the front end. Um, like I said, the canvas is just a placeholder thing for us to um, capture an image. So I'll get into that function in a second and we'll, we'll see the part that it plays, but I just wanna run through these real quick. Um, H4, so that's that status message that we're showing. And it's a, just like we've seen before in the previous parts, it's a piece of information that lives in our data object. And later on, when we execute some of these functions, we basically update this. So we'll see that. Um, we're, we've also put in that button. We remember the button that just says capture. And this is how you uh, dynamically link a button to a function. There is a um, capture function down here. We'll talk about that in a second. And the very last thing is just an image uh, image tag, which is going to show that photo that we, we take every time we press capture. So there's a couple of things going on here that I think are worth knowing um, before we get into this, some of the more interesting stuff about the actual capture. Uh, so the image, first of all, there's this VIF, and I don't think we've seen that before. So VIF is a dynamic condition which will uh, basically tell you whether to render or not render the specific element. So in our case, we don't really want to render the image until there is a thing to render. So right now, I haven't actually captured anything. Why would there be an image down there? Now, when I click capture, now we actually have a photo to display. So now it's worth rendering. And the way that happens is that uh, similar to this kind of syntax and to the curly brace syntax, view is going to look for when it sees the VF flag, it's going to look for pieces of information that um, are defined on the view component itself. So in our case, I'm saying um, if the source does not equal basically nothing, and in this case, the source is the URL of the image, if there is no URL image source, then don't even render the image. But once there is, this will obviously return um, the opposite Boolean. And at that point, the VIF will um, toggle the render based on that Boolean. The second piece is the source tag. So again, we learned about the semicolon notation. This is just saying that the image source, instead of it being defined explicitly, I could have defined it explicitly, for example, you know, like if it was my site.image.png, this would be hard coding it. And if this was a real URL, this is where we'd get the image from. Um, but we need this to be dynamic and we need this to change. So we are going to dynamically bind this property to um, a variable, which is going to live in our component. And in our case, it's just called source. Uh, with, uh, this is manually hard coded. As you can see, there's no semicolon, there's no curly brace syntax. Um, this is saying that this image wants to be 25% of its original width. And this is probably not a good alternate description, but this should say something useful like um, captured image. And basically this text is just there so that if there is no image or it happens to render um, without a source that this text is gonna pop up instead. So at least it'll give you some kind of clue as to what's going on. Um, but beyond that, it's not terribly useful. All right, we talked about these props. We briefly talked about these data objects. And now we wanna talk about how it all comes together. So there's a new flag that we've um, encountered here. The, or sorry, flag is the wrong word, but you guys can crucify me on terminology later. Um, this hook, the mounted hook, life cycle, it's a life cycle hook in view terminology. Um, we are basically saying that whenever this is uh, component is mounted, uh, we want to execute whatever is um, in beneath these curly braces. And in our case, it's a method called init video. But in general, in mounted, I mean, you can put any kind of logic in here. You know, you could write a console log that just says uh, started up. You can do anything. You can execute other functions. 
And it's exceedingly useful for um, making sure that things execute in the right order. Now, in addition to mounted, there's a ton of other view lifecycle hooks that live in the view documentation. And um, you should definitely check those out. There's created, um, I believe there's destroyed, there's before create, before mount. Um, so it, it's very in depth and worth knowing the order at, at which those execute because sometimes it can it can mean the difference between your thing working and not working, especially if you're loading in information from somewhere else, whether it's uh, like a CSV file or whether it's an image URL. So worth getting familiar with. But in our case, we're just going to launch a simple method and it's just going to be our init video method. Uh, we just want to initialize the video capture is all. So this is what that's going to do for us. So first of all, we're going to point um, our reference to a specific object in uh, the component data. Um, technically, this may or may not be necessary. It's it's kind of the school, the view school is split, in my opinion, as to whether or not this is necessary, because some people will just um, use this variable as as this guy the whole time. And there's also a kind of an opposite reaction where people say that, you know, no, you shouldn't really pull from the ref um, directly in that way. You should define it explicitly once as a constant or um, an explicit uh, variable or something like that, and then use it that way. So um, I, I'm just going to use it this way. And for especially for this workshop, it's very easy to use view dev tools and see what this is at any given time. So you can choose whether or not you do it that way in your thing. But for us, just for being able to see what's going on, this is going to be how we do it. Um, so the next thing we do is we try to get user media. So this next bit is a little bit of boilerplate um, from those resources that I linked right here. So I'm not going to spend a ton of detail and time going into them, but I, I'm just going to go over what's happening. So um, we're basically checking if there's media devices and if the function of get user media is even valid. Um, if that's the case, we're going to execute the get user media function and we're asking for video, but no audio because I mean, you know, this, we're not going to do anything with the audio anyway. So why just waste bit rate and user processing power? And because of the documentation and the way that this function works, again, check out the source docs. Um, we know that it's going to return a, a callback object, which we're going to call stream. And we're going to try a couple of things. So if the stream works as it should, we should be able to set the source object of our video, this guy, um, to stream. Okay. And if it doesn't, then we can try one thing and then we can just throw our hands up and say, we, we, we can't do it. Um, this is, this is basically just kind of a, a very, very half-assed browser check, to be honest with you. So, um, for most modern browsers, this API works just fine. Um, for some outdated ones and just in some testing, I found that they don't. So I've kind of put this very lazy catch, um, that accounts for some rando browsers out there. Um, Again, I'm not entirely familiar with why this is breaking some of them. And I also don't care because let's be honest, if you're using Edge or Internet Explorer, you honestly shouldn't be anyway. So um, sorry about that. Um, and of course, if we can't establish a video source um, or a video source object, um, then we're just going to say that I broke and uh, hopefully return some kind of meaningful error. But um, if you're using Chrome, that won't be the case. We'll be fine. And if that does happen correctly as it should, then we're just going to call that same video object. Um, we are going to ask it to play. And we're going to um, set our message in the data object to video capture initialized. So this is kind of part of the reason why these want to live here in the local state, um, not just for debug purposes, but also we can access them throughout whatever methods um, and whatever lifecycle hooks that we want. I mean, I could, you know, just as easily access this, that video, um, that play here, for example, if I was absolutely certain that we would have a source by the time it's mounted, but keeping it in the local state makes it accessible that way. Um, and if, if our, um, very lazy try statement doesn't work, or if we cannot, um, get the user media, for example, um, let's actually show a good example of when it might fail. If I open a private browser, it's going to ask me because, um, you know, this is a totally new browser as far as this app is concerned. So if I say block, uh, this isn't going to happen, right? Because I've blocked my permission um, and it should not go through. And somewhere right here, it should say an error, right? Uncaught, permission denied, though why it's uncaught is kind of beyond me. 
Um, actually, I lied. It's not beyond me. It's because we used we didn't use a catch statement on the promise, and we used the try try, and then an else. Bad coding, guys. You know what? We're just gonna ignore that bit. Um, technically, there should be a second part of this uh, callback that should um, be something like this, and then there's an error callback, and then we do something like console dot error error. And now let's see if I've done that correctly or if I've absolutely embarrassed myself on a semi-live recording. This is gonna be good. This is gonna be great. Some might even call it huge. Okay, so that one's gonna work just fine, but I wanna see the error. So I'm gonna, oops, not that. Inspect. Okay, console block. Aha, okay, now we're getting a specific error message. So this is kind of the, this is kind of the goal, um, as opposed to doing what it was doing before, where it, I mean, it did know the error message just because this is a common API. Um, it should, it should give us something a lot more specific like this. So this is saying permission denies, and this is, um, unfortunately, because of the way we've compiled this app, it's pointing to our um, build.js as opposed to our view file. Um, but this should still be able to to give you a good idea of what what happened. And you can see that this obviously looks a lot different than what we were just writing because um, this has transpiled the view in the ES6 to um, just vanilla JavaScript. So um, why does this keep popping up? Okay, so this is actually yeah how we should be uh, catching that error in terms of a promise. So the dot then is going to trigger the callback, but then if the if basically anything in the then statement doesn't uh, work or if if the promise fails to resolve, um, we should handle that. And technically, uh, there's actually one other thing that we should do. Let's see if this is going to let me do it cleanly or it's going to be a pain in the butt. Oh, it did let me do it cleanly. Okay. So theoretically, whoops, um, we're not only going to want to log that error, but we're also going to want to put this guy right there um, because uh, that's going to be part of the same same handle. So let's rebuild that app. Okay, so error error catching aside, which is a good practice, by the way, um, don't take cues from my laziness here. Um, error catching is a good practice. And that aside, that's pretty much the extent of our um, init video method. And once the init video method is initialized, um, we have our video reference, we have our video source, and our video should be playing live. So that's all good and great. Um, I don't think there's anything super specific about the video style besides that I set an explicit background color. Um, I think just so that I can um, visualize it and see it if, if the source wasn't playing. Um, so nothing too crazy going on there. Um, and then the other piece that we should talk about is the button, the capture button. So let's open this guy again for the hundredth time. Um, this is our capture button and I'm dangerously close to the camera. Um, there we go. So what does the capture actually look like? Let's finally resolve why that kooky canvas was hidden from the beginning. So capture button. All right. Um, this is, again, a part of, of the documentation that I linked here. So check this out for, for some more in-depth knowledge about what this is doing. But basically, first of all, we're going to set, set that explicit reference to our canvas, just like with the video. Um, and then we're going to implement this boilerplate right here, which is much better explained in the Mozilla docs. But I'm going to try and um, bumble through it anyway. So um, we're going to get the canvas context. We're going to set our width and our height, um, which is just basically the um, width and the height of the source material, because if you set it to different things, the scaling is going to be kind of kooky. Um, and yeah, we're just basically doing that. This can probably be simplified into like two lines or one, but F it. Um, and we're going to call the context that draw image function on the canvas, this is specific to the canvas API. So again, docs are your best source and our source is gonna be the video. And these are basically coordinates. So this as well, um, very much worth looking at the docs for because um, if you've worked with things like SVG in the browser, uh, you know that the coordinate system is a little bit kooky. Um, if you're an architect, designer, graphic designer, somebody like that, you probably most familiar with the Cartesian coordinate system where you've got an X and a Y positive is to the right and up negative is to the left and down. Um, sometimes with uh, HTML, that's really not the case. So when there's maximum and minimums, you absolutely have to look at the documentation and understand what piece has to go where because coordinates um, do not work like you think they do sometimes. 
Um, in SVG, for example, I know that the y-axis is flipped. And I've, I've worked with SVG a bunch, and yet I still have to look that up uh, like every time I do it. So just a word to the whys, um, check that out. So we're going to draw that image. And then um, after we do that, we are going to set that source object here um, to a URL. So again, this is a Canvas API function. Um, it's turning the image in the Canvas to a specific type. Um, I like PNGs because PNGs are far superior to pretty much um, everything, but mostly those crappy JPEGs. Um, we're going to set this to a hard-coded URL. So let's kind of actually inspect in the view dev tools what that looks like. Um, app, webcam photos. Okay, so you can see that the source is this big, long URL, which is essentially just a string that makes up a PNG. Um, and once we do that, we're going to console log image captured. We can probably do the, set it to our message as well. Um, you know, we could say this dot uh, message equals uh, image, whoops, image captured, just to get a little bit more robustness in our feedback system. Um, and that's going to be it. And we don't really need to do anything else. So you can see that I've commented this out for a purpose. This um, is, is a familiar solution on Stack Overflow, but we don't actually need to write anything to the DOM. Um, we don't need to write a new image tag. We don't need to explicitly do all this funky stuff. Um, because remember, we bound the image source to that variable dynamically. And here we just set that variable and this is just gonna update as soon as it senses that change. That's just one of those auto magical um, abstractions of a front end framework, which is um, really cool and useful. Um, and that's pretty much it. I also commented out this bit as well, um, just in case somebody found that more useful. So you could just create an array. Um, you know, if you, if you had something like captures, um, uh, is this empty array object? Um, and, and instead of just saving one image at a time, you wanted to save all of them. Um, that's something that you could do very easily. Just kind of push them all to an array over here and then just create a function that like loops through them and downloads them or now analyzes them or what have you. So that's that's completely up to you. But um, in essence, that's it. That's the functionality of our image capture bit. And it gives us all we need to dive into the next part. And we're gonna take the stream and instead of just capturing uh, my, my wonky looking face because I haven't visited a barber in a while because we're on coronavirus lockdown, um, you're going to be able to actually get some analysis and do image recognition on the video feed. So that's going to be the next part. So join us for that and hopefully you enjoy it.